Hi, Bobcats. This video looks at some of the basic aspects of ionic and covalent bonding. Our objectives are to compare and contrast ionic and covalent bonding in terms of the electrons, the properties, and the structures of the substances, and also to show that for ionic compounds, we will write empirical formulas, but for molecular compounds, um, we are going to write molecular formulas. Let's briefly revisit the octet rule um, and how it applies to bonding. Atoms will want to gain, lose, or share electrons until their valence elect electron shell is ns2, np6. Uh, 2 plus 6 gives us 8 electrons, which is where we get the term octet. Um, for hydrogen and helium, this low energy arrangement of electrons is actually just going to be ns2. Uh, that's actually even going to be 1s2. It's only going to be that first shell. And so sometimes the octet rule is called the duet rule when it comes to hydrogen. Helium's not going to form bonds, um, so hydrogen is the element that we uh, will encounter this with. If we are creating ionic bonds, the metal involved is going to lose one or more electrons to achieve its octet, and uh, that's going to create positive ions, so they'll have a positive charge, and we're going to call those ions cations. If we have a nonmetal, a nonmetal will gain electrons to achieve an octet. When it gains electrons, it's going to end up with a negative charge and be a negative ion, and the special name for a negative ion is an anion. Now, uh, to help you keep straight what, which one's the cation and which one is the anion, um, let me show you this little trick. If you look in the middle of the word cation, there's a T, and that T looks an awful lot like a plus. If you look at the middle of the word anion, you'll find an N, and the N stands for negative. With covalent bonding, two nonmetals are going to share a pair of electrons uh, to achieve an octet. To compare what's going on with these different types of bonding, uh, with ionic bonding, we're going to uh, transfer electrons from the metal to the nonmetal. That's going to create a cation and an anion with their opposite charges, and so the attraction of those opposite charges will hold the ions together. There will be a big electronegativity difference between the metal and the nonmetal, and we're going to end up with extended three-dimensional structures with ionic compounds because each ion will be attracting oppositely charged ions uniformly in all directions around it. And so these ions just keep um, clustering into these ionic crystals, building up extended three-dimensional structures. For covalent bonding, it's a little bit different. We're going to share a pair of electrons instead of transferring electrons. And um, this is going to happen between two nonmetals. The negatively charged electrons that are involved in the bond are attractive to the positive nucleus of each one of the atoms that's involved in the bond. So covalent bonding still involves the attraction of opposite charges, but what those charges are looks a little different than in an ionic compound. Um, it's the attraction of electrons for the positive nuclei. Covalent bonding happens when there's a small difference in electronegativity between the two atoms, and covalent bonding will result in discrete molecules um, with something like water, which is illustrated here. Once one oxygen atom has bonded to two hydrogen atoms, the octet and duet rules are satisfied for both of these atoms, and the molecule is done. It does not pick up any additional atoms. Let's look at a concrete example of a compound that has covalent bonding. This compound is known as methane, and its formula is CH4. It's made up of carbon and hydrogen, which means that it's a nonmetal carbon plus another nonmetal hydrogen. When you go and you look up their electronegativities, carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5, 
Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. When you subtract them, you get a value of 0.4. And any values that are smaller than 0.5 indicate a pure covalent bond. When this happens, carbon will share electrons with hydrogen to reach its octet. And another way of looking at that is that hydrogen will share electrons with carbon in order to reach a duet. And so the shared electrons are shown here as I'm circling in red. Um, so these electrons are shared to make the covalent bonds. It's a very different story with sodium chloride, which is a great example of ionic bonding. If you look at the difference in electronegativity, chlorine has an electronegativity of about 3.0, where sodium has an electronegativity of about 0.9. If you subtract these, we get 2.1. A value of 2.1 for this difference firmly puts this into the ionic category. From our other classification scheme, note also that we have a metal, which is sodium plus a nonmetal chlorine. The metal, sodium, as is illustrated in this reaction down below, is going to give away its electron. So this electron will be transferred over to chlorine. And when we write the products, notice that chlorine now has eight valence electrons and sodium is not showing any. Um, an element that has been stripped of all its valence electrons is all the way back down to its noble gas core. Each one of those noble gases has an octet. So when we write an element with no valence electrons at all, just empty like this, that element has um, an octet from that noble gas core. Or we can also show the octet explicitly like we do here with chlorine. Now, since sodium lost an electron, it now has one more proton in its nucleus than electrons in its cloud. And so it has a plus one charge. Since chlorine picked up an extra electron, it now has one more electron than protons. And so it now has a negative charge. When we look at the bonding that's formed, sodium chloride doesn't stop with a single sodium ion and a chloride ion. This first illustration shows a relatively small number of sodium and chlorine ions um, clustered together, but they don't stop here with these 64 ions glommed together. Instead, the crystal keeps growing. It keeps adding more and more sodiums and more and more chlorides, always maintaining a one-to-one -one relationship until eventually you end up with a big old crystal of salt that looks something like this. There are no molecules. It does not stop with just a single sodium and a chloride. When we go to write the formula for a covalent compound, we're going to write every atom that makes up the molecule. So in the case of the molecule shown here, we have two different elements. We have carbon and we have hydrogen. This particular molecule is known as benzene. If we count the number of carbons, there are six. So I'm going to write a subscript of six on the carbon. And if I count the hydrogens, I'll find there are six as well. And so we would write the formula for benzene as being C6H6. But what about something like sodium chloride? If I were to look at this representation, I would say, well, there are about 64 ions in that representation. So that'd be about 32 sodiums and 32 chlorides, but I'm pretty sure sodium chloride is written as just simply NaCl. So what are we going to do? Let's take a look at that on the next slide. An empirical formula is a formula that we write for a substance that will show the smallest whole number ratio between the elements that make up that substance. So for instance, um, if I were to write all of the ions that are shown in this diagram, uh, there are about 64 ions total with half of them being sodiums. So I would write Na32 and the other half will be chloride, so Cl32. But the ratio 32 to 32 can be reduced. Um, both of those numbers can be divided by the same uh, factor, which is 32. And when I do that, I get one of each 
or NaCl. And that's what we're going to do with ionic compounds. We are always going to write that smallest whole number ratio, which is an empirical formula. And we're going to tie that to what we call a formula unit. A formula unit is I guess close to, conceptually it's close to being like a molecule um, because the formula unit um, shows us exactly the elements in the exact numbers that are written in a formula. Um, formula unit is most commonly used when we're talking about ionic compounds, but it, that phrase formula unit could also be used in talking about any kind of a compound because it just refers to all of the atoms that are shown in one formula. This practice, let's work on reducing these compounds um, as written um, to an empirical formula. You'll see occasionally uh, formulas of this nature when we're going through the process of writing the formulas for ionic compounds. Sometimes we have to have this last step of reducing to an empirical formula. So in this first case, both of the subscripts can be divided by two. So if we divide them by two, we end up with something like FeO, because each divide by two gives us a one. In the second case, Cr2O6, the two and the six can both be divided by two. And when I do two divided by two, I get one. We don't write subscripts of one. And then when I take six divided by two, I get three. So this reduces to CrO3. Ti2O4, well, it looks like both of these can be divided by two again. And so that will give us TiO2. Two divided by two is one, which we don't write. Four divided by two is two. In this next case, Cr3PO46, um, the polyatomic ion stays together. We don't want to mess with that. So the subscripts that we're interested in are the six that's outside the parentheses and then the three that's on the metal. 3 and 6 can both be divided through by 3. So once we do that division, we get a single CR, so just plain old CR. And then we get PO4, and the um, 6 divided by 3 gives us a 2. And then last but not least, Fe2O4. Um, there is no common factor, so we can't reduce this anymore. Fe2O3 already is an empirical formula. Our objectives were to compare and contrast ionic and covalent bonding, as well as to write empirical formulas for ionic compounds with those smallest whole number subscripts, and molecular formulas for covalent compounds where we show exactly the atoms that are present in one molecule.